In terms of, uh, just in terms of the opening comments this morning, I, I, I wanted to point out in, in view of this being a International Women's Day and Lee mentioning the uh, Invisible Farmer Project, I had the opportunity to uh, um, view a, a policy discussion uh, involving our former Deputy Secretary Kathleen Merrigan. And one of the things that she made, uh, a point that she made was, uh, I thought was quite interesting, is that uh, in the United States, um, land, land tenure decisions in, in, a, in a state transfer, farm estate transfer decisions uh, are going to be in the hands of women uh, simply because they tend to outlive their husbands. And, and that might be true here in Australia as well. And it's just something uh, that I had never really thought about, but it, it is interesting is that we have a lot of farmland in the United States uh, that is uh, leased land, uh, still owned by um, the, uh, the women uh, who have uh, survived their spouses. So with that, uh, I'll turn uh, to, our, uh, to our outlook. Uh, I wanna take a look at our uh, short-term outlook for U.S. agriculture, uh, looking into 2017, and then uh, uh, this is the information that was presented at our Agriculture Outlook Forum that was held at the end of February. And then I'll also uh, take a look at our longer-term outlook going out 10 years to uh, 2026, and that was also released in February. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges and, and issues that uh, could affect uh, our, our outlook. So I wanted to talk about uh, the uh, short-term outlook for, for crops and um, in particular describe the uh, global market for three major commodities, wheat, corn, and soybeans. And to set up the stage for that, I wanted to take a look at where we are uh, in terms of global production and consumption. Uh, production is, is outpaced uh, consumption for, for uh, most grains and oil seeds for the, over the last four years. Uh, and that was due to the relatively high prices that we saw just leading up to those uh, past four years. And uh, we've had uh, increased uh, acreage put into plantings and we've had increased production both in the United States and around the world. Uh, and at the same time, we've seen increasing uh, consumption, but it just hasn't kept pace with the production as you can see by those circled areas uh, that we've had uh, building world stocks. So as those stocks build, um, we, uh, and particularly for wheat, as you can see in that blue line, uh, that, that uh, stock levels uh, measured in, in terms of days of use uh, mean that uh, we have a, a little bit of a lid on uh, price volatility, but it also puts a lid on, on sort of upward opportunities for prices. So, just jumping right into the uh, projections that we expect uh, prices for uh, most ag products to be flat to slightly higher uh, for the 2017-2018 uh, marketing year. Uh, despite the high inventories that we've seen, all wheat prices are estimated at $4.30 per bushel. And I apologize for not converting that to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, met metric measures, but um, that's the way we think in terms of uh, U.S. dollars per bushel. That's up about 12% from last year. Um, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So we, we have had record yields, um, as similar to what you've seen here in Australia. And, and those record yields have uh, helped to uh, partially offset the lower prices that uh, producers in the US, U.S. saw in 2016 and uh, the 2016-17 uh, marketing year. Um, but we have already seen our winter wheat acreage uh, that's already been planted in the ground uh, is, is down. It's down to levels uh, that we have not seen for 100 years. So producers are responding to the lower prices um, by reducing their plantings and, and shifting to other crops, and, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, we do expect our corn prices to edge up uh, just uh, to $3.50 uh, per bushel, uh, which would be just a 3% increase uh, from last year, but that's down 50% from the record high that we saw in 2012. 
Uh, we're forecasting soybean prices at $9.60 per bushel. That's up just 1.1% uh, uh, from last year and down about 35% from the record that we saw in 2012. And we've seen surpri surprising strength in soybean prices. Uh, basically, we've had some opportunities to take advantage of some marketing issues that uh, occurred in, in our spring uh, from the crop coming out of South America. Uh, and um, and uh, because of the increased uh, uh, world demand, prices have, have uh, despite those large stocks, have, have uh, maintained higher levels than what we uh, initially had expected. And we do have cotton prices projected at uh, 65 cents per pound, down about 6% from the previous year, and rice prices are, are f uh, forecast up uh, at $10.70 per hundred weight, uh, up almost 2% from last year. So one of the, the uh, uh, indicators that we look at that drives uh, planting decisions, particularly throughout the Corn Belt, uh, is uh, to look at the soybean to corn price ratio. And um, that's shown in the, in the uh, blue bars uh, versus the corn futures price in February, which is shown in the, the red line. And what we've seen is that this, uh, uh, as this ratio increases, uh, that means that uh, planting to soybeans is favored over corn, and, and we've uh, had that, seen that rise to a level uh, that we haven't seen since um, uh, 1997, and that was just prior to the, uh, to the takeoff of uh, corn ethanol in the United States and the robust growth in, in Chinese soybean imports. And uh, maybe a more recent uh, historical comparison would be 2014, when we had a rapid increase in China's so uh, soybean import demand in the first half of 2013 and 2014, uh, uh, which drove that ratio up to nearly 2.5 during uh, February. And at that time, that helped pull so soybean plantings up 8%, when, while corn area in the U.S. declined 5%. And that's uh, this uh, high ratio that we're seeing currently is what dry, it's what driving our uh, expectations for reduced corn area and, and increased soybean area coming into this new crop year. So we are expecting our eight crop area, these are the uh, sort of eight major crops uh, to fall almost 2% uh, to 249.8 million acres and that would be down 3.6 million acres from last year. Uh, we've already seen that winter wheat area come down, as I already mentioned. Uh, so we're already seeing producers adjusting their plantings uh, to relatively lower prices. Um, we do expect to see some of that acreage picked up by uh, cotton and soybeans, which have uh, uh, shown uh, a, a bit more price strength. Uh, we expect to see uh, those uh, planted acres in soybeans to, to rise to 88 million uh, uh, acres, which uh, would be uh, reaching almost parity with corn at 90 million acres. Uh, so we really see uh, farmers shifting uh, acreage out of corn and, and into soybeans. Um, and with the lower area and a return to trend yields, we expect some uh, production declines. Uh, but as I, as I mentioned before, we have those uh, large beginning stocks that are hanging over the market, uh, and we expect that to, uh, to temper the decline in supplies. Uh, we do expect uh, the cotton area, as I mentioned, to, to pick up some of the, uh, the acreage, and we're uh, projecting uh, planted acres in, in uh, all cotton um, at 11.5 million acres, and that would be an increase of uh, 1.4 million acres over 2016, or about a 14% increase. Turning to uh, livestock and dairy, uh, even though we saw declines in, in prices for livestock, poultry, and, and milk in 2016, we have uh, that coupled with lower feed costs, and, and that's uh, provided an impetus for, uh, for farmers to, and ranchers to increase their flocks and herds. Uh, cattle also benefited from improved forage supplies throughout much of the year, uh, allowing for rebuilding of the uh, uh, beef herd. Uh, in the case of uh, hogs and turkey, we're uh, seeing support for further growth uh, as we recover from disease outbreaks, uh, which affected hog production in 2014 and um, turkey production in 2015. And, and I should note that just over the weekend, we had uh, um, a confirmation of a uh, high, highly pathogenic uh, avian influenza at a uh, breeder flock in, in the state of Tennessee. Um, and so we're keeping our, our eye on that, and that could affect our uh, forecast. So far, uh, we've had South Korea has, has closed the, the uh, uh, market to U.S. exports of, of broilers uh, and poultry products, 
Uh, other uh, uh, nations appear to be uh, regionalizing that, and that's something that's been very important to us, and we've worked a lot on that since the uh, high path avian influenza outbreak in 2015 uh, in terms of uh, regionalizing uh, responses from our, from, our imp uh, from our export customers. And uh, hopefully uh, we, we've had that, uh, this situation under control, but we are watching it. So we uh, project that total meat and poultry uh, production will hit another record high of more than 10 billion pounds in 2017, uh, as we expect to see uh, production of beef, pork, uh, broiler, and turkey all uh, increase. Milk production is also projected to be at a record, 217.4 billion pounds uh, with herd expansion and growth in milk per cow. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, beef production is forecast to increase as supplies of cattle have increased. Uh, the cattle herd is, has expanded in 2016 for the third year in a row uh, with those improved pasture and forage conditions and falling feed prices encouraging producers to retain heifers for herd expansion uh, through, the late, through late 2015. So with uh, those numbers of, uh, uh, with the numbers uh, uh, of animals and, and milk production increasing, we do uh, expect uh, to see some uh, softening of prices for, for, the, uh, for the most part. Fed steer prices are forecast to decline by uh, to uh, $112 per hundred weight, which would be down about 7.3% uh, from uh, 2016. Uh, broiler prices, we expect, hog prices, we expect to fall to $43.50 per hundred weight, down about 6% from last year. Broiler prices uh, would be uh, down, uh, would be up fractionally from last year. And we do see some strength though in, uh, in milk that's uh, benefiting from um, uh, some uh, export opportunities, particularly in uh, non-fat dry milk. We do expect our meat exports to increase um, following the declines that we had in, in uh, beef and broiler exports and relatively slow, slow growth of, of uh, pork exports in 2015. As I already mentioned, uh, broilers were affected by uh, the uh, high path avian influenza outbreak in 2015, and we lost a lot of those markets. Many of those have re reopened, um, but as, I'm, uh, as I said, we're, we're keeping our eye on this, this latest outbreak, uh, which uh, um, appears to, to be under control, and we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed. Um, but a relatively strong dollar and Russian uh, continued ban on U.S. meat um, and relatively slow economic growth in a number of our export markets uh, may uh, constrain our export growth for meats. We do expect uh, dairy uh, exports to recover slightly in 2017, uh, particularly for non-fat dry milk sales. Um, butter exports are forecast a little bit uh, lower uh, due to uh, relative price and, and the strong demand, uh, domestic demand in the U.S. for butter fat. So let me um, turn to our projections to 2016, and I will point out that um, both our, our near-term projections and our long-term projections are, re, uh, are available on USDA's Office of the Chief Economist website. So first I want to talk a little bit about soybeans. Uh, global trade in soybeans and soybean products has, has risen rapidly uh, since the early 1980s and has actually surpassed the global trade in, in wheat and uh, coarse grains. Uh, consisting of corn, barley, sorghum, rye, oats, millet, and mixed grains. Uh, we're continuing to see strong growth in global demand for vegetable oil uh, and protein meal, particularly China, the EU, and other Asian countries. And we expect that to maintain soybean and soybean products trade uh, well above both wheat and coarse grain trade throughout the next uh, decade. And th what's driving this is population growth and urbanization. Um, that's uh, driving demand and growth uh, for, for agricultural products and particularly for, uh, for meat and dairy uh, products. We do uh, expect world consumption of oil seeds to rise 18% over the next dec decade, and that compares to 13% for meat, 8% for coarse grains, 8% for wheat, and 8% for rice. So let me turn to um, where we're seeing that, that uh, growth in, in soybean exports, and that's coming uh, primarily out of, of China. Over the past uh, 10 years, export volumes to China have increased by more than 125%. Um, 
a, a key component of the global slowdown last year that uh, propped up the dollar value and, and reduced global demand was that slowing economy in China, so it's a big driver in the oilseed market. Uh, we have raised uh, our uh, forecast for China GDP growth this year compared to last year due to uh, recovering growth in its trading partners, uh, their heavy internal debt, and a shift from export-oriented demand to internal demand or, consum or consumption and less fiscal stimulus. Um, despite China's policies affecting wheat, rice, and corn, uh, demand growth for imported agricultural commodities in China is expected to continue to grow rapidly over the next 10 years. And this just illustrates this continued uh, growth in China's soybean exports um, with other countries basically expected to be relatively flat over the next 10 years. You can see that, that the, the growth in oilseed exports, uh, are, um, I'm sorry, uh, global imports uh, is being driven almost exclusively by China. The corn trade, however, is, is being driven by growth in North Africa, the Middle East, and uh, Southeast Asia. And we do expect to see world cotton trade uh, recover. Um, we expect to see it uh, uh, at a 3.8% annual growth rate, growth rate between the 2017-2018 crop year and the 2020, 2026 and 2027 uh, crop years as it recovers from a sharp decline during the period uh, from 2013 through, 20, uh, seven, through the current year. And that's re reflected by the, those reduced, that was reflected by those reduced imports from China. Um, we are seeing China begin to un unwind their large stocks of, uh, um, of cotton, uh, and uh, we expect then to see that start to turn into increased demand for uh, imports. Um, one of the issues that, that we see with that uh, cotton demand in, in, in China is, uh, uh, and, and the stocks of China, is uh, the quality issues, and, and there are a lot of questions about what is the level of stocks and what's the quality of those stocks. And, and so there is a continued need for high quality cotton uh, imports into uh, China. Global con uh, growth in um, uh, meat consumption is, 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 is projected to continue, and, and that's driven by uh, increasing exports by many countries. Uh, we see poultry con consumption rising the fact fastest with projected annual growth rate of 1.9% and beef and pork growing at about 1% each. Uh, Brazil would be the largest exporter of uh, poultry products, followed by the United States, the EU, and Thailand. Uh, we expect the Brazil exports to increase uh, by 33%, reaching 6 million tons by 2026. And Brazil alone is, accounts for about half of the global increase in uh, poultry exports. Um, in terms of uh, beef industry, India and Brazil uh, now vie for the position as the world's largest uh, annual big beef exporters uh, following a decade and a half of rapid export growth. Brazil is expected to export 1.95 million tons of beef in 2017, um, and uh, Indian beef exports uh, are projected to increase from 1.9 million tons in 2017 to 2.5 million tons by 2026. Uh, Australia is the world's third largest beef exporter and, histor and historically has been among the top ranked countries in this category. Uh, we are looking at uh, Australia's beef herd moving into um, a rebuilding phase and uh, under the assumption of normal weather, we expect that uh, Australia's beef exports to uh, gradually increase to 1.57 million tons by 2026, adding 247,000 tons to world exports. And where are those exports going? Uh, primarily China and Hong Kong uh, is where we see those, uh, those uh, beef exports rising the most. Um, imports of grain-fed beef, uh, mainly by higher income countries, are projected to slowly rise. Uh, US, U.S. beef exports um, increased by uh, about 103,000 tons uh, to 1.3 million tons by 2026. And the U.S. is the largest exporter of grain-fed beef in the world. Um, U.S. beef imports, primarily grass-fed fed beef uh, for uh, uh, mix, mixing with, um, uh, with uh, fat trim for use in ground beef and processed products is, is expected to rise uh, gradually over the projection period. And uh, we do expect that the U.S. will remain as the world's largest beef importer with beef imports up by 11.7% over the next decade.
And with these, with these changes, we do see that um, uh, the value of U.S. meat exports uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, the value of U.S. meat exports expected increase in 2017 on increased trade volume in all major categories. Um, and um, we do see over the, over the longer term that exports are expected to become a, a bigger portion of the U.S. Uh, supplies and production. So over the next 10 years, we're expecting U.S. exports, broiler exports to grow by about 20 percent, pork exports to expand by about 22 percent, and beef and veal exports to grow by 37 percent. So let me just uh, talk briefly about some of the challenges that we see in our projections. Uh, one of those uh, challenges would be the uh, macroeconomic outlook. And I just wanted to give you a sample uh, of what that means in terms of uh, beef exports. Uh, USDA's Economic Research Service looked at possible impacts to that 2016 long run projection, or to the 2016 baseline, um, if we were to just uh, look at macroeconomic changes. So if we uh, assume that we had um, uh, slower economic growth uh, over that uh, 2016 to 2026 period, uh, what would that mean to uh, world trade in, in beef? And you can see here that um, what that what that means is that uh, it would favor Argentina and, and, and uh, Brazil uh, exports uh, while uh, depressing uh, India, the United States, and, and other countries. Um, and because we are looking at price effects, income effects, and exchange rate effects. Second scenario would be what would happen if we had strengthening of the U.S. dollar? Uh, what would that mean in terms of, of uh, USDA projections of, of uh, beef imports? And as you would expect, that would depress uh, U.S. exports but would favor other countries. So our trade policy outlook and prospects for uh, uh, um, li liberalization uh, shows that uh, the, uh, on the orange line, we see the average agricultural tariff tariffs that are applied by WTO members compared to their, to their bound rates. And um, the positive view of this slide is that those, uh, on average, uh, those uh, applied rates are much lower than the, than the bound rates, but we do have that upward, upward capacity. Uh, let me just talk very briefly about the U.S. Farm Bill. We are debating, uh, debates have already begun for the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, and, and that's something that uh, we're looking at a very different situation than we had in uh, 20, leading up to the 2014 Farm Bill. Uh, as we came into the 2014 Farm Bill, U.S. farmers have very high, uh, have high farm, net farm income, and our deficit was, was growing, and so that kind of shaped the Farm Bill debate. We had limited funds and relatively prosperous uh, farming. But, uh, and crop insurance, uh, which kicked in in 2012 when we had a severe drought, was seen as, as being very successful uh, and, and as a replacement over uh, ad hoc disaster pay, uh, payments. Um, but as we come into the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, we are projecting uh, net farm income in the U.S. to be much lower than it had been projected um, over those previous years and to remain relatively flat. We still are facing uh, budget pressures, and so we'll see how that shapes development of the farm bill. So just to conclude our, uh, my remarks, uh, we have seen uh, record production build stocks and, and bring, bring down prices. Um, the uh, soybean to corn ratio suggests that more acres of soybeans and fewer acres of, uh, of corn in the U.S., and, and we're expecting overall planted area to be reduced. Uh, record meat, poultry, and dairy production will have to find homes in export markets. Uh, China demand, we do expect to continue to grow, uh, while other op opportunities in other countries uh, will, will beckon. Um, and the conditions leading into the current Farm Bill debate are very different than they were in uh, leading into the 2014 Farm Bill, and the question is, will we get a different result? Thank you. Sorry,